us hear the call to worship. Psalm 96. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. We will sing. Sing, sing to the Lord. Lord. Bless That's his name. name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. We will share the good news with our neighbors. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. We will live to show God's glory. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. We will worship the Lord alone. of our own desire, 
or worship the temple of other nations. Lord, have mercy. When we have denied your invitation to the banquet of love and justice, or fail to extend the invitation to others, Christ, have mercy. When we have adorned ourselves with worry, rather than joy or fail to be her gentle, knowing you are near, Lord, have mercy. Now let us hear the assurance of forgiveness. Praise be to God. Our sins are forgiven. God's steadfast love endures forever. Praise God. Now the scripture reading. Matthew 22, 1 to 14. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it, and went away, one from his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murdered, and burned their city. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding day. The slaves went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Find him hand and foot, and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You'll join me this morning in a prayer of illumination. Holy God, I come to you this morning and thank you for just the sunshine and the coziness of the snow. Thank you for the fresh air. We ask you to open our eyes that we may see clearly, open our ears that we may hear. Soften our hearts in any place where they're hardened, so that we may receive your word, that it may become transformation in life on this journey that we travel with you in Jesus' name. Amen. So the message today is, for many are called, but few are chosen. It's kind of a message on entitlement, but I want to start with the end in mind, that very last verse, for many are called, but few are chosen. You know, I, throughout my church life, I heard just the idea of certain people being favored by God over other people. And I thought the word chosen meant that, well, this person was chosen, but that person wasn't. And it was some sort of a favoritism. And it had to do with maybe the tenets that you keep, or maybe you kept the Ten Commandments, and maybe you left a life of sin and this person didn't. And that's kind of my early years in Christianity. That's how I measured that, the sense of being called and chosen. But as you look in the original language of how the author intended those words, being called by God, is God's gracious invitation to all. So all are called by God. And I had this brought up to the forefront today, our baptismal font, just as a symbol, as it is, of remembering our baptism. And 
everything to do with this, by the way, Melvin Beaver, is this absolutely beautiful workmanship. I think it should be front and center at all times. It is a symbol of our being called by God. It was God's initiation. It was God's action. That's why we baptize infants. It's before you could ever choose God, before you could ever make a decision to follow Christ, God chose you. God named you as beloved. And so I want that as just a visualization. I think that that's where we need to begin our journey into this scripture is remembering through the lens of you are beloved. I am beloved of God. And God welcomes all. It's God's gracious invitation into relationship with God. That's what called means. It's not by our actions. We were beloved first before we did anything great, before we did anything wrong. We were beloved first. And then chosen, if you were chosen, um, the original Greek really uses this specific word as showing us that it's evidence of our response to God's invitation. So many are called, let's say all are called, that God invites all. But those who actually respond with a yes, those who begin to awaken and follow, in response to God's love, in response to God touching their hearts, awakening them to God's wonderful grace and love, that's what chosen means in this passage, and that's the lens that I want us to look through as well as this baptismal font. Um, that's our starting point for today. So this story is an allegory. So it's a literary device. It is not literal. It is that there are characters in the story that are meant to represent other things. So without spending a lot of time on every single element, I do want to say that the whole overarching story is God is the king and God sent his prophets all throughout history to his people, Israel, to try to call them back to God. God was wooing them back and calling them back into obedience and relationship with him, but Israel time and time again said no and they continued in their stubbornness and their rebellion and so they also, you know, beat, and the violence in this, uh, these verses comes out of that sense of violence against the prophets that came as messengers of God's love and grace and reconciliation. But then God said, well, let me send my son, Jesus. And Jesus came to Israel, to the Jewish people first, and they rejected him and, you know, ended up killing him as part of the whole story. But it was God's will and intention that he be killed so that he could raise again and save all of us. And so this story basically is the whole salvation story. But it's even more than the salvation story. It is that, um, you know, many times when I leave us in communion, I'll use this. It's also mirrored in Luke, this same story, um, where it talks about that Jesus went out and called those who were on the margins and on the outside, those who were not Jewish, they were Gentile. He called those that you would normally look and say, I'm not sure that they're in. Uh, they don't look like they are in. Um, they look like maybe they're out. And Jesus would go to those people and call them. And because Jesus did it first at the Lord's Supper, many times I'll use that verse and say, we are also called to go out into the highways and byways. That's another way of, uh, I think it said, go out into the streets and invite everyone. But it's going into the highways and the byways. It's out in the margins where you don't expect to find anyone who might love God or follow God. Um, that's what the focus is in this scripture. And that's what calls my heart. God, God's really been talking to me a lot personally this past week about remembering not only my baptism, but what it means to me in that there are times when I'm working and 
feeling like, oh, am I doing enough, or am I hitting the mark, or, you know, I'm a, I, I want to please, I want to work hard, I'm diligent, you know, all those things, and I, I want to uh, serve God in a way that makes God proud, you know, that's just who, who my nature is, but there are moments where God will just catch me in a moment of, oh, i got to do this and this, and all my planning, and you know, getting everything done, my task list, and checking off the list. And I just hear God say, remember, you are beloved first. You are loved first. It's not about all the things you do. And it just brings me back to that moment of, that's why I do what I do. It's because I was loved first. And that keeps ringing true here. I see God in this story, welcoming all. I see God chasing us with love, pursuing us with love, pursuing those people on the outside as if they were insiders. The part of this message that I move towards the sense of entitlement that this scripture speaks of, I believe, is that today, you know, in our culture, whether it's on a national scale or you know, community-wise, wherever, wherever it is, all over the world it's very much the same. That in Christianity there is a sense of if you believe this, then you're a Christian. And if somehow you believe this over here, you can't really be a real Christian. You're not following the real Jesus or this is required of us. And so if I see you not doing that, then I might have this uh, idea that, oh, well, they're not in. They're out. You know, that idea of us versus them. That who's really in and who's really out. And God was saying, I've invited all these people, and there are those that say no. You know, I have this picture in my head of the old game. I don't know if, you know, if this puts me in a certain age group, but maybe those older than me and younger also played Red Rover. Red Rover, why don't you come over? You know, that game where you're both on each side and you played it in gym uh, in elementary school and you say, you know, Red Rover, Red Rover, why, let's have Johnny come over. And, you know, usually each team will pick the strongest athlete first, you know, the most prized, the one you really want. They're called, they, they're chosen, you know, that favored person. And this story is like Johnny, the greatest athlete, runs away and says, no way. And they just keep running and they don't come over. And then you get maybe down the line, which I consider myself, if you knew my story, you'd be like, how in the world is she up there preaching the word of God? That's the grace and the love of God that broke my hard heart and turned me into a totally different person. And I was, you know, Red Rover, Red Rover, Nicole, come over. I was maybe the last person that God would have picked. And that's, my heart was just so broken and felt just completely changed by God's love. And even this week I was reminded of, wow, none of us deserve this beautiful gift of grace. None of us deserve to be invited to this wedding. The wedding, I mean, you want to look at context, that was the most prestigious event that a king could invite people to back in the day. I mean, that's a big deal. And you not only say no, but you spit on it and you bring violence to the messengers. And the, take away the violent piece out of there, and I really hear God's heartbeat of, I've invited all. But if you won't come, I'm going to go to those who never have been invited. They didn't know they were invited. They're on the outskirts. You know, look at who Jesus, when Jesus came, who did Jesus call? Uh, you know, I think of how God called David. I, I just think about these unlikely people, just like me. You know, Nicole, won't you come over? Uh, just the very act of being invited uh, brings a change in people's lives that you can't even imagine, that they're invited to the table. Think of David, betrayed, killed people, was an adulterer, but he was beloved of God first. 
a man after God's own heart. All this sin pattern in his life, none of that could change that God had called him. And David, what's so endearing about David is God, he kept saying yes. He kept saying, oh my gosh, I screwed up again. Yes, God, yes, I call to you. That was David. Then you have Rahab. You know, if you remember Rahab, she was a prostitute in Jericho. And when the spies came over to scope out Canaan, the promised land, she hid them from the authorities and lied to the authorities, protected them. And she said yes to God's movement in her life, even though it could have meant death for her and her entire family. But instead of death, she became uh, on the lineage, the birth lineage of Jesus Christ. I mean, she is in our uh, Bible of the canon today because of her saying yes. You might have looked at her and said, well, she's definitely not in. <laughs> but God sees differently. And that's what I get from this story. Um, a lot of the, you know, there, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. A lot of that is allegory and used for uh, emphasis, um, as in a, a story that you might tell. Um, but what I keep hearing is God's pursuit of us with love. God pursuing all the, I mean, think of the disciples. They were a bunch of misfits. I mean, definitely not the choice people that you would call and say, oh, I call all the best team to be on my Red Rover team. You know. Um, but God called them, and God is also calling each of you. It may not, to be, to, may not call you to stand up here at a pulpit and preach, but maybe God is. And you have disqualified yourself over and over again. Maybe it's as service as an elder or a deacon. Maybe it's in your community serving uh, in community government or beyond that. Maybe God is asking you to run for state, you know, the state legislature. Um, there are so many things that God may call. Maybe God is calling you to be a parent. Maybe God is calling you to get a job, a specific kind of job. All of these things are calls in our life, and we become chosen when we say yes. Because believe me, becoming chosen, saying yes, is not an easy thing. It's weighty. It costs you something. That God says, come on this journey with me. Okay. And there is much that comes with that journey. God asks much of us. Maybe it's of our time and we don't feel like we have enough. Maybe it's of our resources. And we haven't seen that as a priority. But I, I believe as God has spoken to my heart this week, reminding me of my belovedness and who I am in Christ, that God would also speak to you. Maybe you've never heard that before, that you were beloved first. You were chosen first. You were called first. And somewhere along the way, maybe you're even watching right now, and you're going to become chosen right now because you're saying yes to God and yes to Jesus and yes to the Holy Spirit. And so I, I believe that because Jesus did first, he did it first, that we must also welcome all and have radical hospitality for those that may be on the outside and relinquish our right to sit as some sort of judge saying who's in and who's out. And reminding ourselves that none of us have a right to even be here, but because of God's grace and love, who came first and chose us and called us first. And then when you're called upon to serve God's mission, I pray, just like I do myself and my family, I pray for you as well, that you respond with a yes. And that you be among the chosen. And trust God to help you find your place of service. And I'd love to sit with you and talk with you on the phone or in person, on chat. And let's discover your purpose in this mission that God has for all of us together. Let's walk alongside one another. And um, so that I can be a part of you saying yes to God. Now let us hear joys and concerns.
It's always bad when you step on the music, especially when you're married to the piano player. <laughs> now we will have uh, <clears throat> the joys and concerns. We have uh, from the Presbytery, Reverend Ann Johnson and the two churches she serves, the Monroe Presbyterian Church and the First Presbyterian Church of Knoxville. Prayers for the healing and recovery after surgery for the shepherd's daughter-in-law, Lisa. Prayers for Nancy Lister as she starts a new chapter in her life. Thank you for all your service to the church and the Presbyterian. Prayers for Lisa's dad who is suffering from kidney stones. Nicole, your husband's watching this morning. <laughs> and in, along that line, he says, please pray for them as they shut their house in Washington Friday and prepare to move to Iowa. And I guess that's all. Thank you. Gracious and merciful Lord, our church is working to hear the words of your spirit. Our desire is to learn what and who you are calling us to be in your will. We call out to you that we might have the courage to give to you whatever burdens we enter with today, so that our hearts and minds can be open to you, to your word and to your spirit. As you would search us out if we are lost, but we must also know that when we are not the one, we are members of the 99 waiting together for your guidance. Thank you, God, for all of these requests that have come for us. You are concerned about every small and big thing that weighs upon our hearts. Those, smoke, those that have been spoken here today and those that are unspoken. I ask that you just breathe a breath of fresh hope and faith and life into each of our lives as we look forward, God, into the days ahead. Thank you that you are here with us. And we use our breath today to pray the words that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And your benediction today. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.